Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Level Automotive. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're here at this car lot taking a look at this 2015 Volkswagen GTI. The vehicle has a severe misfire. Uh, they've already told me that it has a code PO302. Uh, we're going to verify that in a minute with the scan tool. Uh, but first of all, we're here to check it out. Let me take you guys inside the car and show you what it's doing. All right, so moving inside the vehicle, we're going to go ahead and start this thing up. Let me show you guys how bad this thing is misfiring. Oop, didn't start up. Oh, battery's getting a little bit low. Nope. No bueno. We're going to have to jump this thing. All right, so I've got my jump pack connected to the battery. Let's go ahead and try to start this thing. All right. The engine is running at the moment. You guys can see the tachometer. And the check engine light is present, so take a look up here. we got a check engine light. We're going to hook up the scanner in just a moment. Let me take you guys under the hood and let's take a listen to the engine. All right, so it's kind of windy out here. Hopefully that doesn't mess too much with the audio. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but this thing has a pretty severe misfire. You guys take a look at how badly the engine is shaking. Hopefully that shows up on the camera, but yeah, the engine is just shaking like crazy. We know we definitely have a misfire. Let's go ahead and hook up the scan tool. All right, so the scan tool we're using today is the Think Tool Pro. Again, you guys have seen me use this plenty of times. Link is in the description, but let's go ahead, click on European. Let's find uh, Volkswagen. I believe it's VW right here. Let's hit OK. All right, so we're communicating. Let's go ahead and hit system selection and let's find the engine control module right here, number one. Let's go ahead and read DTCs. And here we have it, guys. We have uh, PO302 cylinder two uh, misfire detected. We have this P13OA00 hide cylinder. I'm not sure what that is, but we also have this P304 uh, fuel pump short circuit. Um, now, the thing about this is that our battery did go low and the car wouldn't start. Um, so, you know, it is possible that some of these codes could have been set just erroneously because the system voltage was so low. Earlier, when I talked to the mechanic, he said that there was only one code that was stored and it was this PO302. So I'm gonna ask the mechanic just to verify whether or not these codes were there before, and we'll try to see if that has anything to do with what we're dealing with. A few moments later. Okay guys, so I talked to the mechanic. Uh, he was actually able to verify and show me a screenshot of his scan tool uh, that showed that there was only one code present whenever the vehicle came in, and that was the PO302. Uh, so at this point, I'm not gonna concern myself with the other two codes. We're just gonna worry about the misfire code at this point in time. Um, but I do wanna explain to you guys a little bit of a backstory. So the customer was actually here about a few days ago. I'm not sure how long ago, um, but they came in with the same problem. Uh, the shop hooked up the scan tool, told him that he had a PO302, and so the customer actually went ahead and replaced the ignition coil and the spark plug. Now the customer did do the work himself, so I'm not sure you know, if there's a problem where he might have uh, messed up installing the spark plug or the coil, who knows? Uh, but at this point, we do know that we have a brand new coil and a brand new spark plug on cylinder number two. So that helps to eliminate a lot of the possibilities that we could be dealing with. Um, because if they replace the coil and it still didn't fix it, then we can probably guess that the coil is probably still good. Um, the other thing too is that we don't have any codes for ignition coils. Now on these ignition coils, they do have feedback systems in the computer where the computer monitors the coils and the circuits to the coil. So if we had something like a bad connection or a connector that came loose at an ignition coil, uh, we would have some type of trouble code for that. At this point, we don't have any electrical trouble codes that deal with the ignition system or a fuel injector. So if we had a bad fuel injector circuit, you know, we would have some type of code for that. So at this point in time, I'm thinking maybe it's possible that we may be dealing with something either mechanical. And what I mean mechanical is that we could be dealing with a mechanical issue where the engine has low compression, or we could even still be dealing with the bad fuel injector. It's just not the electric part of the fuel injector, the mechanical portion, maybe a stuck pin tool or the fuel injector is just stuck and won't open at all. Uh, because the other thing I will say is that while the engine is running, I mean, the car shakes really bad. The engine shakes really bad. It runs like crap but there's really no smoke coming out of the tailpipe. You know, if we had something like a stuck open fuel injector, we would have plumes of smoke coming out of the tailpipe. We don't have that right now. I don't smell any raw fuel. Um, it just runs really rough. So I don't really think that we have a stuck open fuel injector. Possibly we could have a stuck closed fuel injector where there's not any fuel getting into the cylinder. But of course we need to do some pinpoint checking. Uh, so at this point, we're gonna go under the hood and do a visual check. Uh, but before I actually do that, let me take you guys over to the scan tool and we can look at the actual misfire counters. Okay, so back at the scan tool, we have the misfire counters here for cylinders number one, two, three, and four. Starting up here at the top, you can see cylinder number one. We have zero counters. 
Uh, sonar number two, we're up to 86. Move to sonar number three, we have zero. Sonar number four, we have zero. So we definitely have a misfire on only cylinder number two. Let's go ahead and move under the hood and take a look. Okay, so moving under the hood to do a quick visual check. Uh, the first thing we wanna do is make sure that we don't have any disconnected uh, connectors for the ignition coils. As you can see, we don't. Um, the other thing here that I noticed is that we don't see any fuel injectors exposed. Well, that's actually because this engine is a GDI engine. You guys can see the high pressure fuel pump right there. And if you look closely underneath this intake manifold, I don't know if you guys can see it, but the fuel rail is down there. And so we have our high pressure fuel injectors or GDI fuel injectors underneath the intake manifold. I was really hoping to do some scope testing on these fuel injectors, but because of where these things are located, um, that may be a little more difficult to do. Uh, now, the other thing I did notice is that if you take a look at the number two ignition coil, um, this is still the factory coil. I don't know if they actually changed it or if they did, they probably put an original one. But really what I'm thinking is that more than likely the customer replaced the coil and after that didn't fix the problem, they probably put the old one back and got their money back for the new one that they replaced. So again, we know that they've already tried doing the coil. They've tried doing the plug. We do want to rule out a fuel injector, but I think at this point, the next easiest thing to do would be to verify cylinder compression on cylinder number two and see if we're below spec. One quick thing I wanted to add before we check compression on cylinder number two, uh, there is a test that I like to do. A lot of you guys may have seen me do this before. I like to do it whenever we suspect low compression on a cylinder, and that's a sound test. Just listening to the way the engine cranks, uh, because while the engine is cranking, we're trying to listen for a type of rhythm or cadence to how the engine is cranking. It should have this even rhythm. If we have any uneven rhythm to the way the engine cranks, then we know we may have a compression issue. Unfortunately, on this car, um, it's not as easy as it is on a lot of other cars because a lot of other cars have something called a clear flood mode where we can take our foot and push the accelerator all the way to the floor, hold it, and then we can crank the engine. And what it'll do is it'll disable the fuel system and just allow the engine to crank just with the starter. It won't start, but it'll allow you to listen to the way the engine cranks. Unfortunately, in this car, it doesn't have that feature. So when I try to crank it and I've got my foot all the way on the floor here, you guys can see the engine just starts up. So uh, that doesn't really help us. No big deal. It's easy enough on this engine to go ahead and pull a spark plug out, hook up a compression gauge, and just check the actual compression. One hour later. All right, guys. So fast forward. I'm getting ready to do the compression test. You guys can see I have my gauge and the hose connected to cylinder number two. I went ahead and I removed the spark plug. I have it right over here. Let me show it to you guys. So if you take a close look, let this thing focus in. Come on, focus. There we go. All right, so if you guys take a close look, you'll see that this spark plug is pretty fouled out and it's wet. Now, it does not smell like fuel, so I'm guessing that's more of oil contamination. Uh, now, there's no oil in the spark plug hole itself. It's just on the tip. So from inside the combustion chamber, that's what it looks like. Now, setting this thing up uh, was a little bit troublesome because, of course, we need to disable the fuel pump and on this vehicle, it turned out to be a little more trickier than I thought. If you guys look over at the fuse box over here on the lid, you know, they were not kind enough to uh, label any of these fuses. There's no uh, type of identification marks for labeling what fuse does what. And so I looked at the owner's manual in the car because it still has the owner's manual. And I, for the life of me, could not find a fuse layout in the owner's manual for this fuse box. So I checked on all data. And of course, all data in Volkswagens, like a lot of European models, uh, the information is very spotty. You know, sometimes I think that they get the years mixed up or the models or something. I don't know, but uh, the information that I kept finding was saying that fuse number 10, which is this 15 amp fuse right here, is supposed to be for the fuel pump module. But then again, the wiring diagram showed that it was a 10 amp fuse. Uh, but all the information I kept finding said that this uh, number 10 fuse right here was our fuel pump module fuse. So anyways, I pull the fuse out and the vehicle still starts, still starts and runs. So the fuel pump is obviously still running. And I kind of went down the rabbit hole of trying to find the correct service information for this vehicle. And I just could not find any information that could tell me how to disable this fuel pump. So I resorted to uh, disconnecting the fuel pump, which is actually pretty easy to do on this vehicle. So what you need to do if you want to disable this fuel pump is go ahead and lift the rear seat on the back here. And you got plenty of access to the fuel pump. You can see I went ahead and I disconnected it. It's got that plastic cover over it. Really simple, quick to do. 
so no big deal anyways i'm getting ready to go ahead and crank this engine over and see if we have any compression on cylinder number two so i'm going to go ahead and set this gauge up i'm going to move inside the vehicle and crank this thing okay so we're inside the vehicle we're going to crank the engine over for 10 seconds one two three four five six seven eight nine ten shut it off let's go check out the gauge all right so taking a look at the gauge what do we have oh we got nothing we are still at zero okay let's try that again make sure our hose is nice and tight and connected make sure our coupler is all the way on there oh and by the way i do have the little valve on the end of our hose here because of course if you take that little schrader valve off the tip of the hose you're not going to sustain the compression inside of the compression gauge so that should be good let me move back inside the vehicle and let's crank it one more time all right so for good measure let's go ahead and crank it again oh, our battery's dying here seven eight nine ten should be good enough okay moving back over to the gauge what do we have here nothing zero okay so just to verify we're going to go ahead and do the number three cylinder which is the one right next to it okay so we've got the compression gauge switched over to cylinder number three you guys can see i have the hose connected right down here i did have to remove the coil and the spark plug and when i removed the spark plug for the cylinder number three it also looks pretty fouled you guys can see it looks pretty much like the other one does now i do have a little bit of a bone to pick with whoever designed this stupid bolt and nut that's on top of this coil here you guys can see they have a little ground strap on there and it's kind of this double nut design well you know i really wish that they wouldn't have made it to where i can't fit even the thinnest wrench that i have to hold on to the bottom nut there so really what i had to do was use a pair of uh, pliers and just kind of grab onto the bottom lip of the lower nut so that i could loosen the top one anyway just venting my aggression here about how stupid some of these engineers are that design these cars but anyway let's go ahead and move inside the vehicle crank the engine and let's see what happens okay let's hope we have enough battery let's crank the engine over Yeesh. come on baby there we go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten let's check the compression gauge all right so back under the hood uh, looks like my battery pack is pretty much dead shut that off Anyways, let's take a look at the compression gauge. Ooh, you can already see that we do have compression uh, somewhere around 90, 95 PSI or about 90. Yeah, so we do have compression on the cylinder number three, but we do not have any compression on cylinder number two. So at this point, we can pretty much be confident that we have some type of mechanical issue. Now, I wouldn't say that I'm surprised by it. Honestly, I kind of expected it because this is not the first time I've seen issues with these engines. If you guys didn't know these engines are very typical or it is very common for the timing chain to slip and for it to cause piston to valve contact and the reason behind that is because uh, there is a bad design with the timing chain tensioner there's actually a technical service bulletin and there's an updated part number for the timing chain tensioner because this original one gets weak it causes slop in the chain the chain slips then you have piston to valve contact and if it's bad enough you know it can cause the piston to have damage and at this point a lot of times it's not even worth it to rebuild these engines speaking from experience i can tell you right now the junkyards or the salvage yards that have these engines they usually want somewhere around two thousand dollars for a used replacement engine which a lot of times when everything's said and done can exceed the value of the vehicle i mean i'm not sure about the gti models these might be a little more desirable than the other models like the Passat or whatever uses the same engine. Uh, but in this case, we definitely have a mechanical issue. I'm not 100% sure if it's really related to the timing chain at this point, but what we could try to do is a leak down check to see if maybe we can figure out whether it's an intake valve or an exhaust valve that's leaking. I mean, while we're at it, we could even stick a camera into the cylinder and try to take a look at it. Maybe we can see if one of the valves is bent. Maybe it could be that obvious, which I think might be the next thing that I wanna try. So let me go ahead and bust out my boroscope and let's take a look inside the cylinder. All right, so what we're using here is a snap-on boroscope. And as you guys can see, this tip right here is going to go into our cylinder number two. We're gonna take a look inside. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and set this thing to record. So we're gonna be viewing the actual footage from this camera. All right, so we're making our way into the spark plug hole. 
And the first thing that I notice here is that the top of the piston looks uh, pretty dirty. It's really wet with what looks like either fuel or oil. But again, guys, it doesn't really smell like fuel. So I'm thinking this may be uh, more like oil. The other thing we want to do is take a look and see if we can find any signs of damage, maybe from the piston hitting the valve. Upon initial inspection, I don't see any damage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the camera to our side view. We're going to see if we can get an image of the valve. Okay, so we're looking at a side view of the cylinder here. You guys can see our injector, which is that little nipple there in the center, and our two intake valves right here. Uh, the first thing I notice is that the valves are pretty wet. You guys can see the reflection in the valves themselves. And the other thing that I notice is that the valves don't look bent. They don't look like they've had any contact with the piston and they look like they're seated pretty well around the valve seat so initially I don't see any damage to these valves let's go ahead and try to flip around and see if we can look at the exhaust valves again guys take a look at the cylinder it looks pretty wet so now we're looking at the exhaust valves and to me I don't see any signs of valve to piston contact the valves look pretty much intact and they look pretty seated now I don't know if we're completely at top dead center I didn't measure whether or not we were at top dead center but we can tell that the piston is pretty much close to the top so these valves should be pretty close to being completely closed again moving back over to the intake side um, I guess the other thing that we could do or try to verify whether or not we have a problem with this fuel injector Again, that's going to be that little nipple there in the center. Um, it is possible, and I have seen it before, that these fuel injectors could be stuck open. And so whenever you cycle on the fuel pump, uh, it could be leaking fuel into the cylinder and washing down the cylinder walls, which could be causing our no compression issue. Um, so I guess that's one of the things that we could try to do. I'm going to go ahead and set this thing up, move inside the vehicle. I'm going to cycle the key a few times and prime the fuel pump and we're going to see if this fuel injector is leaking at all okay so with the camera set up i went ahead and i reconnected the fuel pump over here in the back i'll show you real quick lift up the seat you can see we have our fuel pump connected i'm going to go ahead and cycle the key prime this pump a few times to build up pressure into the fuel system and let's see if that fuel injector leaks Okay, so as you guys can see, our fuel injector is not leaking. Now, I did go the extra step and actually start the engine up. Of course, I had to pull the camera out to do that, but I was worried that priming the fuel pump wasn't going to be enough fuel pressure. So I started the engine up, I let it run for like 30 seconds, and then I shut it off uh, because of course I wanted it to build up high pressure in the fuel rail from the high pressure fuel pump. And then I stuck the camera back into the cylinder. And as you guys can see, the fuel injector is still not leaking. So at this point, I feel pretty confident that the fuel injector is not the problem. We've already checked and verified that we don't have piston to valve contact. Our valves are not bent, they're fully seated. So at this point, I think that really only leaves us one possibility and that is piston ring failure on our cylinder number two. I mean, there is still a possibility that we could have a timing chain issue or a timing problem. But when we look at the evidence, first of all, we don't hear any timing chain noise coming from the engine. Second of all, we don't have any codes related to the timing. Uh, and third is that usually when the timing chain slips or the timing is off, that affects more than one cylinder. It usually creates misfires all the way across the board. In this case, we have a cylinder number two that's a dead hole. That's the only cylinder that we have that has a misfire. So with the evidence being presented to us, I feel that it's highly unlikely that we have a timing problem. More than likely, we have an issue with the piston rings on our cylinder number two piston. So the next thing that we could probably try to do is a wet compression test where we pour a little bit of oil into the cylinder, run our compression gauge on there, and see if we have any pressure. All right, so I went ahead and poured just a tad bit of engine oil into our cylinder number two. I've got the compression gauge connected. Let's go ahead and move inside the vehicle and crank this thing over. Oh wait, I forgot to disable the fuel pump. Let me disconnect the fuel pump real quick. There we go. Let's crank this thing over. Let 
Let's check our gauge. Let's see here. Oh, and there we have it. You guys can see we have about 25 PSI worth of pressure. Let me let the release valve go. Yep. So I think at this point, it's pretty safe to say that we have damaged piston rings. Okay, guys, real quick. Um, something I thought of while I was brainstorming about the possibilities of what could be wrong with the car. Um, you know, I thought of whether or not we could have a problem with like a bad head gasket or a cracked cylinder head. Um, but, you know, we would have coolant in our cylinder, which we didn't find. We found oil in there. And second of all, uh, we would have coolant in our motor oil. So let's go ahead and check the motor oil dipstick and see if we have a milkshake. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this thing out. We'll take a close look at it. And the first thing you'll notice is that we don't have a milkshake. But the next thing you'll notice is that our level is correct. It is not over full. So if we had coolant getting into the crankcase, uh, this thing would be way over full and our oil wouldn't be black like this. It would look uh, really milky because that's what happens when the water mixes with the oil. So at this point, I really don't believe we have an issue with the cracked cylinder head or a head gasket. I'm pretty sure we have a problem with our number two piston or piston ring. Uh, really at this point, there's really not much else I can do. What needs to happen next is that this engine needs to get disassembled for a visual inspection in order to find out what actually happened inside of this engine, uh, which at that point, you know, the shop needs to talk to the customer. They need to figure out if it's worth it for them to tear the engine down or whether or not they just want to put a used engine in there, which would probably be the recommended thing. Uh, and if they do put a used engine in here, or if any of you guys put a used engine in one of these cars, um, always make sure that you use the updated uh, timing chain tensioner. If it doesn't have the new design, make sure you replace it before you put the engine in the car. So at this point, our job is done. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it informational, entertaining. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.